there are a couple of days at the end of March of 2020 when the Federal Reserve in the US is buying over $80 billion of assets a day. It's buying a million dollars in assets a second. It's doing that because it's terrified. Even though the United States has rebounded to above where we anticipated it being before the crisis, nevertheless, China has continued to pull ahead. And relative to the rest of the world, which is growing much more slowly than the United States, that gap is opening up even, even more dramatically. So at that brute level, China has, as it were, motored on. The left should be cautious in taking great pleasure or celebrating this crisis of neoliberalism, crisis though it may be, because the idea that, as it were, the left is the natural inheritor of the world that results from it, I think is really dangerous. The COVID-19 economic crisis was a recession like no other. Never before in the history of modern capitalism had close to 95% of the world's economies suffered a simultaneous contraction in GDP. There are few people better placed to discuss the crisis than Adam Tooze, professor of history at Columbia University, author of Crashed, the definitive history of the 2008 financial crisis, and now the author of Shutdown, a lightning speed account of how COVID shook the world's economies. To discuss what the crisis and its aftershocks mean for the future of capitalism, I'm delighted to be joined by Adam today. Adam, to start with, the economic crisis that we've lived through and still are living through has been devastating enough. But how much worse could it have been had we not seen dramatic intervention by governments? I think it's pretty difficult to fathom, in fact, how serious it could have been. Um, If you talk to people who are close to events in the financial markets, in particular in March... Um, they're terrified. It's you know it's not often that you hear senior bankers in very large American banks um, evidently shaken, um, but that was the situation in in the spring. And that's to speak of some of the people who are in many ways, of course, the most privileged in the, in the global economy. If we think about the misery of the hundreds of millions of people who were furloughed or thrown into unemployment around the world, if there had not been very large scale fiscal policy response. Um, That means government spending and uh, cutting taxes, government action in that sense, on the one hand, and on the other, truly gigantic interventions by the central banks in financial markets. We could have seen the real nightmare, which is a combined financial crisis and real economic contraction compounding each other. Um, In America, in, in April of of last year, you know, there were weeks where over 6 million people signed on for unemployment benefit in a single week. There was a period where India's unemployment rate spiked at over 25%. We think something similar happened in China in February of that year. I mean, if this had simply been allowed to run through the system, we would probably have seen major bank failures. Uh, We would have seen the inversion, the flipping of the most important financial market in the world, the US Treasury market. And really, there is no historical map for what happens next after those things happen. And in a sense, what we can see, and this is, as it were, the problem of judging crisis fighting policy, if it works, you never get to see the apocalypse that it is there to forestall. And but what we can do is, as it were, gauge the scale of the intervention. There's simply not been anything like it since World War Two in terms of the rapidity and speed of government spending, the run up of government debt and simultaneously the buying of assets in financial markets by central banks. There were a couple of days at the end of March of 2020 when the Federal Reserve in the US is buying over $80 billion of assets a day. It's buying a million dollars in assets a second. It's doing that because it's terrified. One of the mantras we heard during the crisis was that we're all in this together. Um, The reality, obviously, was, was quite different. How unequal has this crash been in terms of its effects? I mean, it's something that, as it were, targeted all the fault lines of inequality around the entire world. I mean, it's really, it was devastating in that respect. Um, Those people who had comfortable living circumstances, ample space at home, um, had, you know, good digital connections and the sort of jobs that were secure and bomb-proof under any circumstances and could be done remotely, did just fine. You know, it was a sort of weird away day from work for a long period of time. Companies like Facebook have basically sent their people home to work from home for the foreseeable future. If you're at the other end of this, 
it's a total unspeakable nightmare. I mean, you lose your job, you're, you're caught between the collapse in the childcare system and, and uh, your inadequate job. The, you, you can't get out of the house safely. You've got you know, kids that you can't, you can't occupy and you're faced with eviction and um, poverty. It's, a, it's an extraordinary divergence. And if you open this up to the global sphere, it's even more extraordinary. There's a huge gap between the capacity of rich countries to sustain their populations through this crisis. So Europe, for instance, which has a comprehensive um, uh, short time working system. So people are not rendered unemployed. And as a society like South Africa, which even before the crisis had over 30% unemployment and just sees millions of people in the townships thrown into direst poverty. And we have seen some of the after effects of that in the rioting in South Africa in, in recent times in, in 2021. So the world polarizes, societies polarize, families polarize on the gender dynamic. It's, it's very marked difference in the impact on men and women in this crisis. Um, it is women's jobs, which in the first round anyway are most severely affected, service sector jobs. First time in history, in fact, that a recession is driven by the service sector. And then, as we all know, despite changes in family life and a more equitable uh, burden sharing between at least some couples, de facto, a huge amount of the care labour uh, devolved on, on women. And again, the more hard pressed the situation, the more strange your circumstances, the more serious that crisis is, up to and including, of course, domestic uh, violence and sexual violence. Uh, in in the domestic setting. And Shutdown is in some respects a sequel to Crashed. To what extent do you think it makes sense to think of the financial crisis and the COVID crisis as not necessarily two separate events, but part of one long crisis of capitalism? I think that's a fair view. But in a sense, I would w warn against making it too familiar. I think what we saw in 2020 was something even worse than that, in a sense, which is the conjunction of tensions which can indeed be read as a direct continuity and expansion of the landscape I was painting and Crash. And Crash is, of course, really just pulling together the analysis that's being provided by economists and social scientists all over the world of the world since 2008. So on the one hand, that familiar set of tensions inequality, financial instability, mounting geopolitical tensions, the dysfunctions of capitalist democracy, sometimes labelled as populism. All of that, of course, has a lineage which doesn't just go back to 2008. In some senses, it's the bread and butter of school book history back to the 19th century. This is modernity that we're in a sense familiar with. Um, we thought maybe it was over and done with in the end of history moment. And in some parts of the world, after all, things were very calm. Fukuyama wasn't you know, entirely barking up the wrong tree. But those exploded and they were going to explode. And if you look at, say, the IMS reports on 2020 before the pandemic hit, they were already incredibly concerned about what was happening because we had Trump, we had the trade wars, we had the massive inequality problems afflicting many advanced economies. We had persistent stagnation in emerging markets. Bolsonaro was already terrorizing the political scene in Brazil. All of that was going on. And then all of a sudden, from the side, comes this new this new shock. And what, what shutdown is trying to do is, in a sense, describe the interaction of those two things. I wouldn't even really describe it as a proper pandemic book. I mean, I'm not a public health expert. I'm not an epidemiologist. Other people are so much better suited to do that. But where I thought what we needed, as it were, was a book that took all of those more familiar dynamics of tension and stress in Europe, the United States, China, the wider world, and then cross-cut them with this other thing. And what is the pandemic? Well, no, the easiest way to think about it is it's just the biggest exogenous, out of nowhere, deus ex machina shock ever. But of course, everyone tells us that's, well, the good science tells us that's a really simplistic way of thinking about it. For as long as we've been worrying about climate change, epidemiologists and virologists have been worrying about exactly this, something generated, whether it's out of the Chinese lab, which frankly is possible, but or whether it's out of zoonotic mutation, in either case, we're tinkering with nature. In, e in either case, we're in an unbalanced and dangerous relationship with our natural environment. And that was going to blow up on us at some point. And they predicted it over and over and over again. And there were, of course, a series of near misses before 2020. And this is by no means the worst hit that we could have taken. And we shouldn't imagine it's the worst that we will ever take. On the contrary, we should see this as a sort of trial run. We should see this as a test run, a wake up call for where we might be headed. And that's what the book's trying to do, capture the interaction between those two elements. China was obviously the first country to be hit by COVID, but responded with ruthless efficiency. 
to what extent do you think the crisis has accelerated, accelerated its rise and uh, potential clips of the US as the world's largest economy? Well, if you just look at the GDP numbers, um, there's no doubt that it has that effect, right? I mean, right now, everyone in America is intoxicated with the speed of the rebound. There might be a period in which China, sorry, the United States outgrows China. I mean, you know, chalk it up for the record books. But if you look at the levels, so not the growth rates, month on month, quarter on quarter, but as it were, where we are, even though the United States has rebounded to above where we anticipated it being before the crisis. Nevertheless, China has continued to pull ahead. And relative to the rest of the world, which is growing much more slowly than the United States, that gap is opening up even even more dramatically. So at that brute level, China has, as it were, motored on. And at a more elementary level of how people live, I mean, I've had, I have you know former graduate students of mine who have teaching gigs in in Shanghai, and they would say things like, Adam, you've no idea. Like, you know, you go through quarantine, but then you come out the other side and it's like normal life. Like, you know, it's actually as strange as Shanghai might be for a Western visitor. Nevertheless, in some senses, it was more normal in 2020 than anything that we were living in the West. So at that level as well, the regime doesn't take the shattering hit to its credibility that everyone in the West is still struggling to digest. But the other thing, of course, that happens in 2020 is that people put their cards on the table. And that's really, I think, why it's difficult to say, you know, what does this do to China's rise? Because what has happened, it was building up over the preceding years, but it really becomes manifest in 2020, is that the United States is going to challenge China's ability to develop on its current path and try and block it from continuing to develop in the way that it does in the key sector, which dominates, as it were, people's understanding of the future of modern economies, which is tech. And by way of the claim that Chinese technology constitutes a fundamental national security threat to the United States, the US, it's been, again, building up to this since the Obama uh, administration, but really in full force last year, has chosen to, as it were, describe China's growth and continued development as a fundamental challenge to the national interests of the US. That's a major departure and means that whatever happens next takes on a different complexion because we're no longer simply in the old game of, you know, kind of GDP growth Olympics, who grows faster, we're in a much tougher arena now and people are getting, you know, the other weapons out. It's as though we've moved from just a boxing match to the gladiatorial arena where some people have nets and tribe, you know, uh, and spears and other people have swords. And, you know, we're, we're the, the range of weapons is multiplied. You mentioned the speed of the US recovery there um, and it's obviously outgrown both the UK and Europe significantly. To what extent do you think that can be attributed to the Biden administration's fiscal stimulus? And do you think that big bet has paid off? Well, it's not just the Biden administration's fiscal stimulus. In fairness, right, it's the three packages of stimulus which come in in the spring of 20 and then in December uh, 20 and then uh, again uh, uh, this year. And the other thing to understand about American politics is it's all about Congress, especially fiscal politics, right? Who's in the White House matters, but even more, it matters who controls what the congressional decision making. And Congress, you know, in a bipartisan way in, in 2020, did two big packages, really, really big packages. And then once the Democrats got control of both the White House and Congress by the skin of their teeth, they doubled down and added this, this third. Those together are the largest stimulus, fiscal stimulus that we've ever seen in peacetime. And it's real immediate spending. So not to be confused with, say, the EU's next gen EU package, which is much more like the thing Biden is trying to pass now, the infrastructure package, similar in scale as well. No more in the kind of 500 billion than the trillions benchmark. Longer term in its aspirations, transformational in that sense, but much longer term. Whereas what the US did is basically just pour money into American society and the American economy last year. I mean, we, we calculate that the rate of poverty actually went down in 2020, at least through the summer, despite the huge surge in unemployment. So you have an unprecedented, like literally ungraphable surge in unemployment and poverty falls. Why? Because Congress decided actually to just give poor people money, which reduces the poverty rate, at least briefly, and and certainly substantially reduces misery and uncertainty. So yes, that works. And to my mind, it's a shame the Europeans aren't even more ambitious. You, you can't focus just on the EU. You have, of course, also to look at national policy programmes. And the UK's fiscal policy programme in, in 2020 was gigantic, obviously. And it's even more potent because it's backed up by central bank action in all three cases. So broadly speaking, the mix is similar. 
the differences also have to be explained in terms of the underlying structures that are available. So the US, one of the reasons why the US spending has to be huge is they don't really have an adequate national unemployment insurance system. They have one, but it's a bit of a Potemkin village and it was rigged together in the 30s during the New Deal period. And being America, it had to be bargained with deeply conservative southern states that don't really like paying unemployment insurance. So there is notionally a system, but what you get in Florida is completely inadequate. What you get in Massachusetts is much more like a European kind of a deal. So in a crisis, when you're going to get loads, massive unemployment nationwide, Congress has to act, which is a big part of what, why the, the bills in the American stimulus are as large as they are. They don't, lack, they don't have the infrastructure of the welfare state. On the whole, yes, the answer is simple. Fiscal policy works. It stimulates growth. Europe should do more. The United States is getting a bonus now because it did a lot. A big question mark in 2022 is can it continue? Or will other more natural, quote unquote, forms of growth take over? Much has been said about how Biden's foreign policy has mirrored elements of Trump's in in relation to the Afghanistan withdrawal. Do you think Trump also, to some extent, paved the way for Biden's big spending by um, being relaxed about huge increases in the, in the US budget deficit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we live under the sign right now of, you know, this Amer- American brand of radical monetary thinking called modern monetary theory. And I often like to tease them by saying, look, you know, there's never been a president more suited to the magic of fiat money. In other words, states being able to say, I declare this money than Donald Trump. You know, I mean, as long as his name was on the check, more checks were better. And the only time he really seriously harassed the Fed in 2020 was when he thought they weren't acting quickly enough. So a lot of us, and I'll say this with a sort of degree of self-criticism, it's like, you know, progressive leftist, um, internationalist kind of minded folks feared that in a global crisis, a xenophobic nationalist kind of brute like Donald Trump could, wouldn't understand the imperatives of global economic management. And it turns out you don't really need to. All you really need to understand is the priority of the S&P 500, which is what he's absolutely focused on, the American stock exchange, in other words. And that does the trick for you, right? Because American companies are deeply enmeshed with global capitalism. So if you prioritize stimulating that with no holds barred, you, you get an almighty stimulus. And more importantly, having him in the White House meant that there wasn't a lot of incentive for the fiscal hawks, the genuinely fiscal conservative Republicans in Congress to oppose the actions being taken. They did, in fact, kill a second stimulus in the summer. Many people think that if there had been one over the summer, Donald Trump might have been reelected. That the GOP couldn't get their act together on. But in the spring, they did. And so having Trump there and Trump being conservative only really in name and and not really having a shred of economic doctrine in his body, definitely, I think, enabled some freewheeling action. And the same is true of Jay Powell, like, you know, the, the, the man who ran the Federal Reserve, who was this sort of very low key, you know, um, often fancied um, Republican lawyer, who was hoisted in there by Trump, apparently because Trump thought that he looked like the head of the central bank should, whereas Janet Yellen, who's a diminutive, you know, uh, elderly lady, doesn't look like Trump's idea of an American central banker. I mean, it's literally the reason, apparently. He's also a very rich, successful businessman. And, um, and it turns out he, too, is an utterly pragmatic radical. Um, with the same basic impulses. And in fact, more of a sort of social egalitarian. He's more like a kind of one nation Tory Republican. In that he, he appears genuinely to care about the welfare of low income Americans and the, the horrendous shock to the low wage labor market in the spring of 2020. So conservatives of that ilk, if it's even reasonable to call them conservative, have turned out to be you know, potent managers. We should remember Ben Bernanke, the legendary head of the Fed during the 2008 crisis, is also was also a self-identified Republican appointed by a Republican president. Um, so, you know, in both cases, they've acted, but only with the support of the Democrats in Congress, right? You, you can't, it turns out right now, you can't manage American capitalism with the Republicans in control of all of the levers of power. The UK obviously suffered the twin fate of, of one of the highest COVID-19 death rates in in the developed world and one of the worst hits to GDP. As a Brit watching from afar, how bad did the UK's response look to you? Well, one's torn. I mean, I'm not just a Brit. I'm also, you know, not a Tory Brit. Um, So, and, and, you know, a a, a passionate Remainer. Um, So I didn't, I didn't approach this, I should say, with, you know, uh, an open mind. 
you know, of course, it looked bad. It looked terrible. It looked terrible in the early phases in particular. And then it looked risky. And then the vaccines came along. One has to incorporate the vaccine programs into an assessment of the virus response. It's, it's, it's because in the end, that turned out to be our virus response, right? One of the conclusions of the book, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not expert enough or, or well suited to do the kind of national comparison of crisis response approaches to the crisis, the kind of governance Olympics is, is not the purpose of this of this book. So I didn't focus in on the on the particular peccadilloes. But I mean, sure, in March 2020, the Boris Johnson administration looked particularly cynical, particularly shambolic, particularly messy. The outcomes are surprising only if you have a rather candy coated vision of how the NHS functions. We know how resource constrained it has been. We know how dysfunctional much of the decision making was. So in that extent, it's not that surprising. And the pandemic also has a logic that can't be reduced to the functionality of policy and institutions, right? This this virus is just dangerous. If it gets into a big city like New York or London, it's runaway. And really, the amount of control you can exercise over it until you've got a vaccine is really pretty slight. You know, absolutely massive draconian lockdowns can slow it down. But the only thing that's going to get you to safety is the rollout of a, of a vaccine program, quick rollout of a vaccine program. And that's, in the end, what both the United States and Britain were able to do. A, they played an active part, obviously, in developing, a, a preeminent part in developing the vaccines, and then proved adept at rolling them out quickly. Um, you know, not to not to full coverage in the US case in particular, but nevertheless, to the level in which in a city like New York, it's been interesting. Our experience of the pandemic after the initial shock has, in fact, been relatively calm. Do you think it was ultimately the active states that saved the UK, both in terms of the vaccine program, uh, which is obviously among the world's most successful, but also in terms of the furlough scheme and the extent to which that prevented a surge in unemployment of the kind seen in the US? I think this is uh, definitely one of the lessons of the crisis, that governance matters, that state capacity matters, whether we're talking about the um, capacity for public health administration, better or worse, uh, for, as you say, a big R&D push, uh, and then the ability to roll it out, or whether we're talking about sophisticated collaboration, tacit or acknowledged between the Treasury and central banks. Um, And all of those things have turned out to be crucial. Yes, also the presence of sophisticated labour market institutions are crucial. Um, And it's tempting, I think, there from a progressive point of view to go, aha, told you so, uh, we've won. Um, And that, I think, is is an absolute uh, fallacy. That's where we go wrong far too easily, because for the second time now, after 2008, Um, The full resources of highly sophisticated modern states, their entire balance sheet has been essentially placed at the disposal of strategies which are profoundly conservative. Um, You know, faced with a pandemic, conservatives just fine. You just want your previous life back as quickly as possible. Status quo, you take it, you know, bite your hand off if you'll give me status quo. But it is conservative and it's conservative also in its distributional consequences. You know, all of the caps come off the conventional policies that constrain self-dealing in terms of subsidies. In Europe, governments are handing out subsidies right, left and centre to big businesses. Those are good for jobs that keeps people in employment. Sure. Part time, uh, the the short time working systems keep people in employment as well. But they are also implicit subsidies to employers. Uh, many of whom would in fact have kept on the workers anyway on their own dime and instead of being subsidised by the government to do it. You do that because it's a kind of protection racket, right? You you want the population to feel safe and so you're willing to pay whatever it takes to get you there. But we should be under no illusion about the scale of the redistribution or just the distribution of resources from the public balance sheet to the private sector as a whole. Crucial, beneficial as well for those in the most precarious positions, but nevertheless also beneficial to those who are extremely well off. You've been incredibly prolific during the crisis, both in terms of producing shutdown and also writing regular long reads for the New Statesman and other publications. Do you want to talk a bit about your your writing style and both some of the challenges and opportunities of of writing during lockdown? Well, it was <laughs> it was a period of hyperactivity. I'm still a little puzzled by exactly. I mean, I was energetic before, but the last 18 months has certainly been the most prolific in my life. And, you know, one wonders, of course, about the the psychodynamics that go into that. It does sometimes feel a little manic. It's been productive, though, I think, also in terms of linking ideas up. I mean, as you know, I'm I'm sort of densely enmeshed in social media, on Twitter, um, 
in in the in the literally second by second minute minute by minute discussion of what's going on and i find that profoundly energizing and intellectually productive so i a as 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 sort of alarming in some sense as this surge has been it 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 has also been generative i mean it's been a tough and difficult environment to think in my my family my immediate family was very directly affected by by the shock mercifully none of us got ill but but my wife's business was was basically paralyzed my daughter was furloughed from college um so it was an intense environment psychologically as well and and that has that has been it has been fertile i've never written as a historian i've you know i've written about crises compulsively but i've never written about one that i was actually in or being forced by one to write about it, which is essentially what happened in the spring. I had no intention of writing this book, and like everyone else, I had other plans for 2020, uh, and, and and those were to you know to write about the climate crisis, and and I ended up writing shut down because I simply couldn't. I was doing it anyway. I was I was forced through the conversations I was having on the basis of Crash, which itself was a sort of regurgitation and distillation of people's analyses of 2008. And, and now 2020 came around and we were sort of wrapped up in, OK, so how much of our understanding of 2008 transfers? If this is happening in the US Treasury market, how does it relate to what we think we understand about the taper tantrum in 2013 and so on and so forth? And and that was so immersive that it wasn't possible. It, it felt it would feel almost perverse to sort of stand back from that and not just go with the flow. I mean, I'm somebody who earlier in my career struggled with mental blocks, emotional difficulties in writing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a therapy addict. Um, I, I don't function well without the help of that kind of reflection. Uh, but it's enabled me to get to the point where I can live with the iterative process that writing is. I mean, you know, this is a as a journalist, you know, you have to become very pragmatic about your own processes in generating prose. You have to be able to stand back from it a little bit, um, not in the sense that you're detached, but in the sense that you just are willing to work through the iterations. And that freedom emotionally, psychologically, in relation to the writing has is is why I'm productive. I, I know I know why I was not productive before, and that was because I couldn't free that that sense of experimentation of just giving it a shot. And that is one of the things as a historian that you realize when you move into this new mode is, is the genuine risks, intellectual risks. It's not a matter of personal pride so much. It's just, am I getting this right? You know, have I, have I understood this correctly? And what will the next two weeks tell me about whether I'm right or wrong? Um, you quite rapidly, I think, get past the fear, the shame element of this, because everyone out there who's publicly articulating a position is subject to the same risk. But the actual wages that you make, the kind of gambles, are, are can be quite terrifying, a little bit scary. And they're certainly it's also quite addictive, though, because it's, you know, you're, you're constantly, as it were, pushing a projection also somewhat into the future. The big conceptual question that a lot are asking is whether we've now entered a new economic paradigm and whether the COVID crisis will come to be seen as the definitive end of neoliberalism. What's your view? I think it's a very complex question to which I have begun in this book to give something like, not a provisional answer, but I've at least begun to map it up. And crashed, I was kind of leery about getting into an explicit discussion of neoliberalism as such. It just didn't seem necessary to what I was trying to do in that book. I didn't regret that, but I did feel that in a sense in addressing this issue and with the topic so live at the time I was writing and what I was writing about, that um, that I couldn't avoid taking some kind of position on it. And I think the thing about neoliberalism, many people think it's something that's sort of empty of content, whereas I think my my view would be that it's defined in so many different ways. And our problem is a problem is, as it were, to understand the relationship between the different elements of quite plausible definitions. So if you treat neoliberalism as a set of ideas, a kind of creed, a consistent body of thought about economics, I think you'd have to say not just 2020, but you know, over years, it has, as it were, lost its coherence. Um, especially if you think of it as rooted in sort of the Austrian school of the, you know, the interwar period, the kind of Quinslobodian narrative that goes all the way back to the Habsburg Empire, or if you, even if you focused in the 1970s. So I think at that level, it's really in crisis. But I, I think that's also always, I mean, that's a tempting way of analysing it, especially for intellectuals, if you like, because you, you're very, you know, into ideas and and other intellectuals, but I think that's an inadequate way of defining what it is. So I add three other dimensions in this book. Um, 
I take, well, there's a fifth in a sense that I take the balance between nature and the economy and various implied assumptions about that balance as, as it were, the subject of the disaster. So I don't explicitly thematize that. That's going to come much more to the center in thinking about climate. But if you focus on what we saw in 2020, there are three other elements that matter. Practices of government. James Meadway had an essay recently in Tribune on this issue, which I thought was very good on the need to think not just about ideas, but about how we govern. And then social structures, in other words, class formations that neoliberalism could stand for. Some cultural studies people like to talk in terms of subjectivities, which is also a good way, an interesting way of thinking about this. But if we just focus on the distributional and class issue. And then another way of thinking about neoliberalism is that it was an American project of hegemony, right? It was a power political project. It was a geopolitics. And depending on which way you think about neoliberalism, I think you arrive at a rather different image of the crisis, the punchline, To put that up front before we spare us a bit more is that the left should be cautious in taking great pleasure or celebrating this crisis of neoliberalism, crisis though it may be, because the idea that, as it were, the left is the natural inheritor of the world that results from it, I think is really dangerous, misleading. As a practice of government, neoliberalism has always been Janus faced. It's always had two sides. David Harvey analyzed this brilliantly very early on in a very heart eating Marxist account. And he just said, look, like, of course, it's about order and law some of the time, but it takes force, violence at times to actually construct that new order. Think Miner Strike, think Pinochet. Those would be classic instances. And if you think of neoliberalism that way, then all we saw last year was, as it were, in a sense, it at its most grandiose, mobilizing the entire apparatus of the state, some would say even its repressive dimensions, to save the system as it is. And what is the system that it's saving? Well, it's a system of class relations and inequality that are absolutely dramatic. And could one say that 2020 did in any way moderate those? No, on the contrary, right? 2020 is a shock which compounds those. And the dramatic measures that were taken in terms of fiscal and monetary policy had the effect of compounding, in fact, working off the structures of inequality that were part of the instability that generated the crisis. We're very familiar from this from 2008. You do QE and you, in a sense, benefit the people who drove the crisis in the first place. And something in a similar is happening in 2020 in that the the financial markets melt down, the central banks pile in, and who is it that benefits? Well, it's the great investors in the financial markets. In the United States, there's a streaming gap between the profits made by people with portfolios and those without. So at that level, what are we looking at? We're, We're looking at as it were, a system which is still reproducing a set of class relations which and, and, and power relations which are incredibly robust and is using every means of the state at its disposal to secure those. Is this a break with neoliberalism? Not in the sense that it's a break with the society that neoliberalism made. And if there really is a break with neoliberalism, I'm tempted to say it's in a dimension that's frankly kind of terrifying, which is that if neoliberalism was ultimately an American power political project, And its underlying assumption, especially in the phase from the 1990s onwards, and I would agree with James Meadway that that's what we should focus on if we want to see as it were real existing neoliberalism, was unipolar American dominance, unquestioned American centrality. That was the basis on which you could just calmly say all growth is good, all global growth is good. Either it drives the Chinese by way of the convergence theory towards us, or in any case, it makes us richer, right? And the growth of China just blows that assumption out of the water. And the reaction of the American ruling class, the action of the Pentagon in particular, the hard power people, um, is, is, is dramatic. And that's what we saw in 2020. So we could indeed be seeing the breakdown of, you know, uh, this would be, as it were, the liberal international order, but driven by, not as it were, the challenge from outside, so much as the willingness of the Pentagon to sacrifice all of the principles of you know, basically the free movement of capital because they want to exclude Chinese money from Silicon Valley. They want to cut Chinese suppliers out of the technology supply chain. It's an incredible strike on the hardcore of dynamic economic engine by the hardcore of the American state. To those who say we've entered a new era of authoritarian capitalism, would your response be that authoritarianism and capitalism have always been enmeshed? Well, I think, I mean, I I don't have a problem with saying we might be in a new era of authoritarian capitalism. I just, I would agree, certainly, that that it it wouldn't be a surprise. And and there's there's nothing, there have been authoritarian capitalisms in the past. And the 
modus vivendi under which capitalism goes hand in hand with certain sorts of freedom is a tense one. And the project of progressive liberalism, as I understand it, in a Keynesian vein, has been, as it were, the determined, restless effort to explore how much freedom one can, as it were, open up. And this isn't because capitalism is necessarily sort of a totally dominant, its own kind of totalitarianism, if you like, but because it's fragile and haphazard and ramshackle and breaks all the time and needs fixing constantly because it doesn't really self-sustain in a very organized way. And so, as it were, the project of liberal capitalism is that kind of a, an engineering project. Um and that one could, as it were, morph from that into various versions of authoritarian capitalism seems entirely plausible to me. I mean, I used to work, after all, on the history of Nazi Germany. Um, and that is nothing if not a blending of an authoritarianism with a capitalism. The thing about those kind of projects, or the Nazi one in particular, was it was short-lived. So we never really got to see where it was going to go. But in the meantime, extreme violence, genocidal violence, holocaustal violence went hand in hand with the reproduction of that capitalist system. That's not to say that what's happened in China is not, I mean, it's a, it's a huge historic shock. And I would be, I mean, if what we mean by saying we're in an age of authoritarian capitalism is the rise of China, I'd be tempted to say maybe we should not apply that label to it. And we should just focus on the thing that's actually driving our perplexity at this moment, because authoritarian may not be the best word to describe what's mm. going on in China, right? It's not just any old authoritarianism. How would you characterize the Chinese economic model now? Well, I'm not sure they've got a model. I think what they're doing is is improvising. I think what they what we've got is a a, a mixed economy at the actual level of businesses which is powerfully enmeshed in global supply chains and the, de- the, the dynamics of technological development and domestic state building. So those are, as it were, the sort of real drivers. Only part of a society which is much bigger and much baggier, we don't spend enough time talking about the fact that 600 million Chinese are no longer abjectly poor the way they were, but still not part of the sort of Shanghai Pearl River Delta growth miracle on the one hand. And then on the other hand, what you have is a communist party, which is very much still a communist party in its own terms, 21st century Marxism, which is itself constantly improvising new solutions. They would like to create a model, but to do that right now, they clearly feel they need to break some China. So the the uh, uh, the extraordinary regulatory, uh, re- regulatory interventions which they which they which they have begun to make um, and which began last year. I mean, one of the really signal developments was last year was the was the attack on Jack Ma um, and you know the first most prominent Chinese oligarch to really fall to Xi's uh, uh, new politics of, of social and economic social and economic equilibrium. You can see I'm dodging your question as to what kind of a model it is, because I don't think that talking in terms of models is very helpful. We can talk in terms of vectors of change. We can talk about masses of you know, poverty. We can talk about huge unsolved problems of development, which still exist there. And we can talk about the Communist Party and the people in that party who have particular visions. But I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm skeptical of the possibility of summarising that and wrapping it all up in the concept of a, you know, of a Chinese model at this moment. I don't think any of us really can convincingly say that we have a model. Indeed, one of the arguments of the book is, in a sense, that to think our current moment and understand it, we probably have to depart from those kind of ideas of, you know, model normality you know, which was still quite strong after 2008. Central bankers used to talk all the time about normalization. I don't really know how you could seriously do that now. Capitalism has obviously had to contend with a succession of crises, the, the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, there's the, the climate crisis, which, which we'll come on to. But do you think from an ideological perspective, it's in a stronger position than some may suggest because the threats posed by Jeremy Corbyn in the UK and Bernie Sanders in the US were seen off. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess the, the, the line that I run in the, in the book is that the basic diagnosis of our social problems, uh, our economic and our ecological problems offered by the Green New Deal was, was spot on. I mean, but of course, they did suffer on both sides of the Atlantic um, a crushing defeat. Um, but the interesting thing, and this goes to your point, is that, and it shows, as it were, the adaptability of the centrist managers of 
um, Western Europe and the United States, is that the diagnosis offered by the Green New Deal has effectively been incorporated into modern government practice in the EU in the form of the next gen EU package and the Green Deal. You could argue in the in the energy politics of the of the Johnson administration in the United in the United Kingdom, but clearly in the Biden administration, which literally could have lock, stock, and barrel took Sanders' policy team over the summer of 2020 and bolted it into the Biden the Biden campaign, and unsurprisingly, therefore, certain key figures around Biden, especially in economic and social policy, come straight out of the left wing of the Democratic Party. So it's that ability, if you like, to assimilate its critics, um, which I think we have to come to terms with, those of us who, who think of ourselves as being on the left. There was a huge political defeat on the one hand, and then nevertheless, as it were, the force of the arguments being offered by that Green New Deal left is demonstrated by the way in which they're incorporated into practical policy afterwards. What do you make of the Labour Party's trajectory under Keir Starmer? I, I'm disappointed by it. And, and um, you know, I, I, I wrote a rather bitter piece in The Guardian about um, after Starmer's, you know, big speech earlier this year, um, the the flag waving disgusts me, um, unsurprisingly, given, given my biography and um, and I, I have I've no sympathy for it. I don't really understand it. It doesn't strike me as very convincing as an electoral strategy. I'm, I'm however, no, you know, expert on British electoral politics, and and would hate to be in the position that the advisors to Starmer are in in trying to devise a strategy for somehow providing a counterweight to the Tories. Um, but personally, um, I find it profoundly disappointing and a retreat from the. The scale of vision of, of and, and historic um, vision of something like the Green New Deal. Historic, not in the sense that you sort of, you know, satisfy yourself with with endlessly rehearsing sort of sentimental stories about the Blitz and Dunkirk, but historic in the sense that you actually recognise where we're at in 2021 and what needs to be done in the next 10 to 20 years if our children and grandchildren are going to have a livable planet to inhabit. That's historic. That's the sort of history that I thought the Green New Deal really, for all of my differences with the left wing of Labour on other issues, fundamentally grasped. And that's uh, indispensable, you know, to have that kind of political clarity. And that's lost, I think, in the Starmer team. And they're in a much more difficult position than the Democrats are in the in the US, in the sense that the Tories have occupied a large part of the climate space. So, you know, it's difficult if you're not going to go to the whole Green New Deal level, it's quite difficult to stake out a territory for Starmer's kind of laborism, whereas in the US, frankly, anyone who admits the climate problem is real is already putting space between themselves and the GOP. In on the whole, of course, the political situation in the United States is profoundly worrying, and indeed, last year became critically uh, so. But in terms of the tactics, it's much easier for Biden to position himself as climate president, given the know nothing flat Earth position of the GOP on the issue than it is for Starmer to do the equivalent in Britain, where the Tories have, in a sense, occupied the climate space, at least by their own lights. Some speak of COVID-19 as a warning from the future with the, the climate crisis and the risk of future pandemics in mind. How much of an economic threat is is the climate crisis? And, and what's your view of the so-called carbon bubble? I think this is absolutely right. I, I do think we've just witnessed the first crisis of the Anthropocene. We've 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 just witnessed the first intersection, and and this is the lesson of 2020s, right? Is that the Anthropocene crises are not going to be just about the environment? They're going to be all the other old crises and the environment compounding each other, and that's what we've seen. And a pandemic, unlike the climate, so far at least has the uniquely terrifying and dangerous property of being properly global immediately, like utterly all-encompassing immediately. And so far, the spillover from the climate crisis, which I would, as I think many people would maintain, is already ongoing, tends to be more localised. It's terrifying when it happens in the form of like a gigantic typhoon in the Indian Ocean, you know, threatening Bangladesh or um, or a, a drought um, that destroys crops, but it hasn't yet reached the dimensions of the comprehensive lockdown that we saw. And in fact, it could be quite difficult to imagine anything which could. But, you know, that doesn't in any way void the analysis because there's every reason to think there's more pandemics in the pipeline. And indeed, as the globe warms, there's every greater risk of mutation happening in various ways. So I, I think the climate crisis poses... Um, a variety of different types of challenge. Um, 
specifically to the economy. One is of the local variety. In other words, we could experience very severe food price shocks. We could experience, you know, um, you know, everyone's, you know, nightmare is some appalling high heat episode in India that killed tens of millions of people. We could see that kind of phenomenon. If we transition and begin to transition, then indeed the the stranded assets problem is real. In other words, the carbon bubble bursting. It's very significant. Whether it's systemic or not, I think is an open question. Um, one of the things one shouldn't do with the with the fossil fuel sector is, as it were, by the hype, exaggerate their significance. They're big, but they're not that big. If you actually look at the number of people who are employed in these sectors, economics isn't our problem. Social changes, technological changes. But, you know, there are a couple of, it, you know, the, the percentage of people employed in getting oil and gas out of the ground is trivial. I mean, in most places, it's nowhere near a percentage point. Even in places like Texas, it's not the whole economy by any means. But it's real, and you could you could have spiraling effects from that. But with climate, the thing to focus on is I don't think the precise estimates. It's simply the apocalyptic nature of the world if we go anywhere, you know, north of two degrees uh, warming. Um, once we're in the three, four degree scenarios, you know, the GDP growth rate is going to be the least of our problems. Um, because life as we know it will cease. And then we may be able to maintain various types of economic activity, as we saw last year. You can carry on, you know, various types of economic activity, like the one that we're engaged in now, you know, under really rather weird circumstances. But um, that's not really what we're interested in, right? So so I think it's those three layers. We could see immediate shocks now, which could devastate the Caribbean economy, for instance, or, you know, large parts of the global agricultural system with ripple effects that spill out. We could see transition risks to the fossil fuel sector from decarbonisation, which we should welcome for this big thing and just figure out how to deal with them. But the real thing to focus on is just the total apocalypse mm. of, of climate breakdown and global heating. So essentially, we should worry less about where the next economic crisis will come from and more about the fact we're facing something much, much worse. Uh, well, we should. We need to do both, unfortunately. And we need to. Also, we also need to worry about where the next pandemic's coming from. Um, and we need to mobilise that entire armoury of instruments that we saw in play in 2020. So the immediate stimulus efforts, the backstopping by the central banks, the, you know, the, the social policy interventions to stabilise labour markets, you know, God love them, the, the European investment programme in green and tech, which also was done that year. Um, we need to, and, um, and the crash R&D programme, the, the operation Warp Speeds and its cousins around the world. We need to be mobilising that entire apparatus of government um, if we're going to have a chance of dealing with this. And then we need, obviously, to figure out the geopolitics of our current situation, because if this becomes uh, one of intensifying rivalry between the United States and China, then there are a whole series of other apocalyptic risks. It's not for nothing that the early imaginings of climate change in the, social, in the science literature in the 60s were tied up with nuclear winter and were tied up by high altitude, you know, H-bomb experimentation. Um, in a sense, our generation has lost sight of that further, earlier apocalypse, which is absolutely integral to the modern world, which is, you know, superpower nuclear confrontation, um, which is heaving back into view. The, the Obama administration set in train a absolutely gigantic modernization of America's strategic nuclear arsenal. The Hawks in Washington are talking in terms of competition with the Chinese. So there, add that to the picture. Thanks very much for, for joining us, Adam. It's a pleasure. And you can read Adam regularly in The New Statesman by subscribing in print and online now.